When you read the Satipatthana Sutta, a discourse on establishing mindfulness, it's easy to miss the fact that it's an incomplete description of right mindfulness. But in a way, the Buddha announces it right from the beginning. He gives the formula for right mindfulness, keeping track of the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. And then the same formula for feelings, mind states, mental qualities. But the questions he asks and answers in the sutta deal only with a small part of that formula. So what does it mean to keep track of something? Anupasana is the Pali word. And as for the other parts of the formula, what does it mean to be alert? What does it mean to be ardent? How do you put aside greed and distress with reference to the world? Those aren't covered at all. It's good to keep this point in mind, because sometimes you read it and it seems like you're just aware of whatever comes and whatever goes and just leave it at that. The question of ardency hardly comes up at all. You see this particularly in the treatment of feelings. It sounds like we just watch feelings come and go. But when the Buddha describes how feelings come and feelings go, they don't just come and go on their own. The mind takes the potential for a feeling and fabricates it. In other words, turns it into an actual feeling. So there's an intentional element in all your feelings. If you miss that fact, you're missing some very important insights. This is one of the reasons why when we do meditation, we're very consciously trying to give rise to feelings of pleasure, feelings of well-being. In the city of Banana Sutta, the Buddha calls these feelings not of the flesh. They don't come on their own. He talks about pain not of the flesh. He doesn't define it there, but you look elsewhere in the canon, and you see that it means reflecting on the fact that there is a deathless goal, and you're not there yet. And that's a pain that the Buddha actually recommends that you develop as motivation for practicing. It may be painful, but it's pain to hope. I mean, most pains serve no purpose at all. But this pain reminds you that there is an escape. The pain there is simply the fact that you haven't gotten there yet. The hope is in the fact that you can. This provides motivation to practice. As for pleasure and out of the flesh, that's the pleasure of getting the mind into right concentration. And that's something you develop. You do it through focusing, say, on the breath, and then talk to yourself about the breath. How does the breath feel? Is it too long, too short, too fast, too slow? Why would it feel good right now? As the Buddha says, you try to give rise to feelings of pleasure, give rise even to a sense of refreshment or even rapture, and then you let that spread throughout the body. Now again, that's not going to happen on its own. You have to do it. The image the Buddha gives is of a bathman. Back in those days, they didn't have bars of soap. They would have a kind of bath powder, which is like flour. And then you'd mix it with water and make a kind of dough, and then you'd rub the dough over your body. And a good bathman preparing the dough would mix it in such a way that the entire ball of dough was moist. There were no dry spots. But the water didn't leak out. That means that you have to knead the water through the dough the same way that you would knead water into bread dough. So there's work to be done. This is something you do, you give rise to, you develop. And then once you develop it, the Buddha says you try to maintain it. So when you find a comfortable way of breathing, maintain that. Stick with it. And be very sensitive to what feels good right now. You can ask yourself which parts of the body tend to be most sensitive to what feels good in, as you breathe. They tend to be down the front of the body, in the area of the heart, sometimes in the area of the throat. 
but notice where you feel it most clearly. And then keep the breath coming in and going out in a way that makes that spot feel really good. And this may require that you change the rhythm of the breathing every now and then, because the needs of the body will change. What feels good for a while and won't feel good after a while. And John Lee's image is of a cook fixing food. And if she fixes the same thing day after day after day, her boss is going to go look for a new cook. So keep on top of what the body seems to need and what the mind finds interesting and enjoyable. So this is something you develop, you work on it, because you're trying to see the extent to which you do create your feelings through the act of attention. Normally as we go through the day, we have an instinctive way of focusing on some feelings and not on others. Some people have a tendency to focus more on pains. Some people have a tendency to focus more on pleasure. But all is very unconscious and the extent to which we play a role in giving rise to feelings gets buried. When things are buried like that, you're not going to get any insight. So this is why the Buddha teaches meditation in such a way that you're consciously giving rise to feelings, so you get sensitive to this process. The techniques that simply say, well, watch whatever comes up, tend to deny the fact that you are actually creating what's coming up. It makes you seem like you're just a, an observer. And this applies both to meditation techniques that focus on developing mindfulness and insight, and those that focus on developing strong concentration. There are some that say, well, just sit with whatever comes up, and the concentration will come on its own, and you won't be doing anything. That's making you blind. If you don't admit what you're doing, how can you gain any insight? Because insight, as the Buddha said, is insight into the process of fabrication. Fabrication is the way we shape our experience. And if you deny that you're fabricating, then you're not going to see anything. So take this as a test case. To what extent can you create a sense of well-being? Feels good for the body, feels good for the mind. Learn how to maintain that, because there are a lot of lessons that come from the maintaining. That's what it says. Settle in. Indulge in that feeling of well-being. Now this doesn't mean that you let go of the breath, because if you do that, then the cause of the concentration will blur out, your attention will blur out, and it'll feel nice, it's comfortable, but you're not really sure where you are. When you come out of it, sometimes you wonder, was I awake? Was I asleep? It's called delusion concentration, and the name tells you you're not going to gain insight there. You indulge in the pleasure in the way in which you work and then enjoy your wealth. Enjoy the wages that come from your work. If you stop your work just to enjoy the wages, there comes a point where the wages don't come anymore. to focus on what needs to be done to maintain a sense of well-being. And you get clearer and clearer on what it means to fabricate a feeling. And you also get clearer on the things that come up in the mind that would pull you away. As the Buddha said, there is no strong concentration without discernment. And one of the things you're going to learn how to discern is how not to fall for the thoughts that come wandering through the mind, and say, you've had enough just sitting here doing nothing but breathe. Think about this, think about that, or this is getting boring. We're not here for entertainment, we're here for the sake of learning how our mind puts things together, because the way it puts things together 
causes us suffering, as long as we don't see clearly what we're doing. As long as we do this in ignorance, there's going to be suffering. If we learn how to do this with knowledge, it can turn into the path. So learn to generate these feelings not of the flesh. Care for them. Look after them. Because they're an important part of the path. Think in terms of the analogy of the raft. The part of the raft that takes you across the flood. And when you're in the middle of a flood on a raft, you hold on. You don't let go until you get to the other side. 